One day a shepherd is looking after his sheep on a deserted road and this very fast sports car, shiny sports car, pulls up beside him and this young guy gets out in an immaculate Armani suit and he says to him, if I can tell you how many sheep you have in this field, can I have one? The shepherd thinks for a moment and says, good deal, go ahead. So he parks his car and he gets out his mobile phone and he plugs it into this computer and he gets this GPS signal and he's able to kind of calculate how many sheep are in the field and he reports back to the shepherd. Shepherds, when I see shepherd's pie in an Irish pub, I, I eat it because shepherds are hard to find these days. <laughs> and so the, you know, that juxtaposition between the kind of romantic, we have this kind of romantic view of shepherds. We've almost kind of marginalized this very noble ancient profession that takes a lot of skill, often is passed on from father to son. And we've either kind of marginalized or sentimentalized them, but we really don't understand what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about, I am the good shepherd. And part of the theme of the Easter celebration is that in the lectionary, we have these I am sayings from John's gospel. And John's gospel is absent a lot of miracles and parables that are famous. For instance, the parable of the good Samaritan or the parable of the prodigal son is absent in John's gospel. But instead, we have these seven I am sayings. And I I see them as like a beautiful medieval cathedral, they're like seven rose windows that illuminate the nature of God. Many of the parables are about the compassion and the forgiveness and the nature of God. So in John's gospel, we don't have these, but we have have these I am sayings. And, And I am the good shepherd is one of seven. So the first one is I am the bread of life. And I like to think about these sayings, I am the bread of life. They're often linked to a miracle. And you think of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus feeding the community, the people who are hungry. The tradition of of God feeding his people in the wilderness. The second is, I am the light of the world. And you think of the miracle today. We leave out the gate, but it is connected that I am the good shepherd and I am the gate. Jesus is the gate through which one passes from death into eternal life. I remember um, sitting beside somebody who was dying in another, this was another parish, but she had, she had been very much a devout Christian, was very familiar with the prayer book, and we, we read the Psalms together. Her son was there. And she had this image, and she talked about, I want to go through the door because Jesus is on the other side of the door. I am the gate. And the good shepherd is the one who will give life to save his, who gives his life to save his sheep. And there's a deep connection with these two sayings, the sacrifice of Jesus. We talk about Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so these I am's are about the forgiveness and the transformation of God at work in our lives today. <clears throat> and each one of those I am phrases, are, it's kind of audacious. There is, a, there is a kind of audaciousness about Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. And it's interesting, the reaction of people was, oh my God, he's speaking with such authority, how great, or who the hell does he think he is? And what we have here in the celebration as we journey through Easter is that we are moving from Jesus of Nazareth, the healer, the preacher, the reconciler, to Jesus the Christ. And that we we are beginning to see what God, what our relationship to Jesus and the relationship of Jesus to God kind of looks like. And it's reminiscent of, remember the story of Moses, when Moses goes and he has this theophany of the burning bush. And God's talking to him, I want you to go to Egypt. I want you to liberate my people. And Moses is making all these excuses. And he says, well, who do, what authority do I, am I doing this? Who's sending me? And the voice says, say, I am, is sending you. 
And the word is often translated, I am what I shall be, I am what I am becoming, is another way of thinking of God. And so Jesus is using this very ancient Old Testament phrase in a different way. He talks about when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And it's actually, those, those of you who like to find a way to kind of decompress from the world, the, the I am, in Greek, it's a haimi, haimi. And it's a wonderful kind of centering prayer just to say that word, I am, over and over again. And it settles the soul and the mind. So this is a, this is a very important connection. Um, and then I want to talk about the image of shepherd, because again, the, the shepherd stuff, we, we, have, we have either sentimentalized it or we have limited it to uh, religious people. Often the, the pastor, the bishop, you know, in his medieval, her medieval garb with that big old shepherd's crook, we've kind of limited leadership to religion. But in fact, the, the biblical meaning of the shepherd was not religious, it was political. And if you, were, if you were a listener, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, you would have had an image of King David, who was the young shepherd boy who slays the, the nasty giant. And the image of the shepherd is this young, muscular warrior with a cudgel who's fighting off the mountain lions, who's protecting his flock, who is prepared to get in danger between whatever is threatening the flock and his flock. So it's, a very, it's not a sentimentalized kind of buddy Jesus, meek and mild kind of shepherd. It's a warrior. It's somebody who will fight and somebody who will risk their lives for the flock. Um, so I wonder what that means for us today. There's, um, there's a wonderful definition of the kind of archetype of martyrdom. And there's a woman called Carolyn Miss, M-Y-S-S. She wrote a book called Sacred Contracts, and she describes the martyr archetype. I'm going to read it to you. In the social and political world, the martyr is often highly respected for having the courage to represent a cause, even if it requires dying for the cause of the sake of others. Suffering so that others may be redeemed, whether that redemption takes a spiritual or political form, is among the most sacred of human acts. So we have that going on in this idea of shepherd and leadership. It's a kind of self-sacrificing that people standing up for what they believe, and if it means that they lose their lives, then so be it. And in the history of this country, we have many examples of people who sacrificed their uh, well-being, their family life, and their lives uh, for something that was noble and much more important. And we think of, of people like George Washington, who was very much in the biblical image of the shepherd, the warrior. Or we think of Abraham Lincoln, who lived and led this country through a most painful period of civil war. And he had a vision of a country of free citizens and diversity. And right through to the modern age, we, we think of people like Martin Luther King, who he applied the teaching of nonviolence of Gandhi and the call to love and forgiveness of Jesus. And through his words and actions, King had a vision of a very different America that we are still trying to live into. Both men fit the archetype that Carolyn Meiss's uh, description of martyrdom encapsulates. The shepherd is therefore the one who gathers and holds the flock even when everyone is not on the same page or sees themselves as part of one fold. The shepherd is vulnerable to the wolf and the lion and has to look beyond his or her own safety 
so the flock can move into higher, greener pastures. And opposition to this vision is the norm. It's not to be surprised. Opposition is the norm. And how do we find the courage as leaders and as shepherds to do that? You know, many of you know I've been kind of researching this year the, the history around the First World War. And we're coming, you know, 2018. It's 100 years the war ended. And we had that wonderful photograph that showed up of this, uh, these two children playing outside St. Peter's in 1917. And so it's kind of, it's, it's kind of re-stimulated um, what was going on at that period. And, and, and one of the great, I think, one of the great shepherds and one of the great leaders of this country um, is Woodrow Wilson. And here you have somebody who led this country at a critical time when Europe was tearing itself apart through nationalism and military aggression. And he became obsessed with the long-term solution to scattering and slaughtering of human beings around the world. And the only solution that Wilson could see was to create a kind of the gathering at one table. He prepares a table before me in the face of those who trouble me. And this vision of the League of Nations um, that obsessed him, where people and governments would sit together to build a system of communication and share resources so that world violence would be minimized. And it's amazing today to read the reaction both of the populace at the time and of Congress and the, and, and the, the opposition that um, he faced. And he decided to run for president on the league ticket. And it broke his heart and it broke his body. You know, he wasn't martyred, but his life was certainly shortened by the struggle to kind of live out and to believe that this was the best, not only good for the country, but really good for the world. And it was about sacrifice and using the great wisdom and resources of this country uh, as an emerging nation. And only 50 years ago, he was a boy. He remembers the Civil War. He wrote a book about the Civil War. So the devastation of the Civil War would have been fresh in his mind and experience. And how do we reconcile and repair relationships? And how do we do that and translate that on a global scale? And that was very much a part of his heart. He was also a deeply religious man. And it's interesting that when war was finally declared, he moved from a pacifist position in realizing that, that America had to get involved in this war. And it was in Holy Week in 1917. So the discussions and the imagery, and he quoted Ezekiel in the, in the speech when he reluctantly declared war. Um, and he says, my life would not be worth living, he told a friend in 1915. It would not be for the driving power of religion. Winston Churchill said of him, it seems no exaggeration to pronounce that the action of the United States with its repercussions on the history of the world depended during this awful period of Armageddon upon the workings of this man's mind and spirit to the exclusion of almost every other factor, and that he played a part in the fate of nations incomparably more direct and personal than any other man. And it's very interesting that when he was, when he was very much part of the negotiations after the war, he didn't want heavy reparations. That was coming from England and from France. He was very foresighted about the, the Kurds in Turkey. He was, he was a great visionary that saw that if we didn't kind of fix it now, that this would come back to haunt us. And he was right, because the reparations and the culture of punishment that was created led to the rise of fascism and Hitler and the Second World War. Um, but yet Wilson, I think Wilson is much more the image of the good shepherd, of what that, what that means in the context of the people who would have first heard it. So I sum up the seven I am sayings. 
are deeply packed images that illumine our imagination. And particularly the, in the Easter season that we move from Jesus the teacher to Jesus the Christ. And, and Jesus becomes this bridge and this gate, a new way of seeing ourselves and being bridge builders uh, into the future. And that is important in our leadership, not just in the religious world, but in all aspects, in business life and in our political life. And I've tried to give you some examples of how we apply these principles in our lives, in decision-making, in men and women like Wilson, that was always costly, bearing witness to those higher ideals. Amen.